So we talked about tubular reabsorption, right? So that we're going through the basic processes of urine formation. And the next step in production of urine is tubular secretion. So tubular secretion was the movement of substances from the peritubular capillaries into the tubular lumen. So this was an opportunity for us to add things that were not originally filtered, add them to the, um, the contents of urine. And we secrete a variety of things. The three key, th the key um, substances we secrete that's important for us to talk about include hydrogen ions. So hydrogen ion secretion is an important um, process in regulating body uh, pH. Potassium ions get secreted, which is also an important process that controls body potassium. And there's a large category of substances that we call organic cations and anions. And these are usually foreign to the body. So things like um, drugs that we consume and environmental pollutants um, are fall under this category. Um, and they are under, um, they get secreted also. So let's first talk about hydrogen ion secretion. Hydrogen ion secretion plays an important role in acid-base balance in the body. It's an opportunity for the body to be to get rid of acid. Okay? It occurs primarily in the proximal tubule and in the collecting duct, and there's just a minor amount that happens in the ascending lip of Henry. So mostly in the proximal tubule and the collecting duct, a little bit in the ascending lip of Henry. Now hydrogen ion secretion, okay, happens through two possible mechanisms. So um, the mechanism and the and the way where it varies is in the last step of secretion. So up here, the this is illustrating the last step, which you see in the proximal tubule. And down here is illustrating the last step that we see in the collecting duct in the loop of Henry. So for hydrogen ions, so acid that starts in the blood, okay, um, crosses the basal lateral membrane, no matter where along the tubule, hydrogen ions cross the basal lateral membrane through a proton pump, essentially, a hydrogen ATPase pump. So it uses energy in the form of ATP to actively pump hydrogen ions across the basal lateral membrane. Once across, hydrogen ions can cross the luminal membrane in two different mechanisms. In the proximal tubule, hydrogen crosses the luminal membrane through a co-transporter with sodium. Okay. Now, notice that sodium is entering the cell. So that means that in the proximal tubule, hydrogen ion secretion is being coupled with sodium reabsorption. Okay? That's important, I'll say that again. In the proximal tubule, hydrogen ion secretion is coupled to sodium reabsorption. So this is just another thing that we are accomplishing through sodium reabsorption, hydrogen ion secretion at the proximal tubule. At the collecting duct in the loop of Henle, hydrogen ions are crossing the luminal membrane through a facilitated diffusion um, transporter. Okay. So it's just crossing through facilitated diffusion. So that's the mechanism for hydrogen ion secretion. Potassium also um, gets secreted. Now this potassium is an interesting substance because potassium undergoes both reabsorption and secretion. Okay. Um, the potassium reabsorption occurs at the proximal tubule. And it really happens via the passive diffusion in the same way that we saw chloride and urea. Okay. So about half, um, potassium undergoes about 50% reabsorption. So about half of the potassium that gets filtered 
ends up getting reabsorbed through this passive mechanism in the proximal tubule. But potassium is also actively secreted at the distal tubule in the collecting duct. Okay. Now, potassium reabsorption is passive and unregulated, but potassium secretion is active and regulated. So what I mean by it's regulated, it means that if potassium is low, we secrete very little. Because remember, secretion means we're getting rid of it. So if potassium, plasma potassium is low, we're going to try to minimize secretion. But if plasma potassium gets high, we're going to enhance secretion so we can get rid of it. So what's the mechanism? So keep in mind, this is happening at the distal tubule, and it's happening at the collecting duct. So we're talking about secretion. So we're talking about the movement from the peritubular capillaries into the lumen. So potassium starts off in the blood. It diffuses, and it crosses the basal lateral membrane through the ATP pumps. Once inside the cell, potassium uh, passively diffuses out of luminal membrane through an open channel okay? and is now in the lumen. So that's the mechanism for potassium secretion at both the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Okay? So you notice, so notice here that potassium crossing the basal lateral membrane through the pumps. Notice if you recall when we talked about sodium reabsorption, which is happening almost everywhere in the, in the nephron, potassium entered the, crossed the basal lateral membrane in the process of sodium leaving throughout the nephron. Okay? but you only have potassium secretion at the distal tubule in the collecting duct. Okay, so the question is why wasn't potassium secreted throughout the tubule whenever sodium is reabsorbed? Okay, and it really has to do with the location of the passive potassium channel. Okay? It's only in the distal tubule and the collecting duct, that these passive potassium channels are on the luminal membrane. In the proximal tubule and these other places where sodium is getting reabsorbed, the passive channels are on the basal lateral membrane. So the potassium that moves in the cell just moved right back out, right, in the same membrane. So it's only in the distal tubule and the collecting duct that potassium has an opportunity to cross that luminal membrane and be secreted. <coughs> so remember when I said that, I said earlier when we were, we were um, summarizing reabsorption events in the nephron, I said that sodium um, and chloride reabsorption at the distal tubule and the collecting duct were variable and under hormonal control. Well, the hormone that controls it is aldosterone. And aldosterone, remember, was one of our was our mineral corticoid. And the mineral corticoid, like uh, typified by aldosterone, has is named mineral corticoid because it has the tendency to cause sodium retention and potassium loss by the body. So aldosterone controls the degree of sodium reabsorption at the distal tubule in the collecting duct and at the same time simultaneously controls how much potassium secretion that goes on at those um, segments. Okay. So in the distal tubule and the collecting duct, the mechanism for sodium reabsorption 
sodium crosses the luminal membrane at the distal tubule with the co-transporter with chloride at the collecting duct through a passive channel and then crosses that basal lateral membrane through the pumps. And simultaneously, as sodium is being reabsorbed, potassium has an opportunity to get into the cell through the pumps and then exit at both of those segments through a passive channel. Okay. So aldosterone controls the rate at which sodium is reabsorbed and simultaneously the rate at which potassium is secreted at the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Okay. So that's why aldosterone um, will tend to cause potassium uh, conservation. So it will tend to cause potassium retention, right? Potassium is going into the body. Excuse me. That's why aldosterone, the mineral corticoid, is going to cause sodium retention, right? Sodium is, getting, is going back to the body. And potassium loss. Potassium is getting added to urine. This is the mechanism. Okay? And the way aldosterone exerts its effect on, on this mechanism is actually twofold. It Aldosterone helps to open up sodium channels on the luminal membrane. And most importantly, aldosterone increases the expression of ATPase pumps on the basal lateral membrane, which means that aldosterone acts on the distal tubule and the collecting duct, causing the cells to make more of these ATP pumps which results in more sodium reabsorption and more potassium secretion. So we're going to talk about later what determines how, mu how much aldosterone gets released. Okay. What controls the release of aldosterone? Because when it gets released, you're going to hold on to more so sodium and you're going to let go of more potassium. Okay. So lastly, we've got the secretion of the organic anions and cations. So an anion is just a negatively charged ion. A cation is a positively charged ion. So we have organic compounds that are positively and negatively charged that are essentially um, either metabolites or the actual substance that usually are foreign substances. Okay? Um, in the form of drugs or food additives. Okay. Um, sometimes they are chemical messengers like hormones. Okay. Some hormones fall into the category of organic anions and cations. Okay. But generally we're talking about um, foreign substances. Now there's two specific pathways. There's a, there's a pathway for anions and there's a pathway for cations. I, I'm not going to um, show you the specific um, mechanism of transport, but what you what I want you to understand is that there are two different pathways and actually both of which involve sodium reabsorption. So both of these pathways use energy and are coupled to sodium reabsorption. So the, the purpose of this secretory pathway, why even have um, an organic anion and cation um, secretory pathway? There's two main reasons. So lots of these ions, lots of these organic ions are traveling in the bloodstream bound to plasma proteins. So for the time that they spend bound to plasma proteins, they don't get a chance to get filtered by the glomerulus. Okay, so if one of these organic, ana uh, one of these organic ions has a affinity or plasma protein binding of about forty percent, it means that forty percent of the time, it's when it arrives at the glomerulus, it can't get filtered. So, so a secretory pathway creates an additional opportunity to get these waste products into 
um, or get these substances into the urine. So it's going to end up increasing the speed of elimination of these substances. Okay.